My, my grandfather, he was uh, more or less of an, the entrepreneur. You know? yeah. he, he didn't care. He wanted to get out and try something new. If you've got a storefront instead of just like, I want to sell this out of my old tractor shed behind the house, you <laughs> yeah. know, not to say you can't, it's just, it's a little harder that way. I don't want to, I don't want to forget about where we come from mm-hmm. and, and, and the people who, who buy the feed and, and what struggles they deal with. Welcome back to the Wealthy Cowboy Show. I'm your host, Crockett Carruthers, and today we have Luke Fritz on of Red Chain Feeds. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit about feed, a little bit about business, uh, and they also ranch uh, themselves. So we'll get into all that. How's it going, Luke? Man, it's good. Good. Glad to be here. Yeah. Glad to be here. Uh, first off, I want to get in uh, to the history of Red Chain. I mean, I'm sure everybody that's had horses or cattle or whatever knows about red chain feeds um i don't know how nationwide y'all are but it's definitely a big staple in our area down here in central texas and um got good horse feeds got good cattle feeds and and everything and you see it at nearly every feed store so yeah um tell us a little bit how red chain got started and and uh, we'll go from there yeah for sure well i appreciate you saying that for one um no, uh, well, we've been in business for 55 years now. Uh, my grandfather started it in 1969, and uh, kind of the way the story goes down was um, he was he went to Texas A&M <coughs> and graduated, left, and became a uh, an ag teacher. He did that for about a year, and I mean, it just really wasn't wasn't what he was doing. And uh, the company out of Fort Worth, Allied Mills had reached out to him and was like, hey, we want you to come be a sales rep for what they were selling at the time was Wayne Feeds. So he went on with them and was with with Allied selling Wayne Feeds for, mm, I'd say, seven years-ish. Um, kind of learned the feed business. Yeah, yeah. I mean, he was an excellent salesman, excellent salesman, which, you know, he grew up there, there in Comanche or in between Comanche and DeLeon, so... They farmed, they raised cows, and, and uh, did a lot of farming around Proctor. And so he knew, you know, like he, he knew a bunch of stuff, but he he worked for them for seven years. And uh, there had been a promotion that was coming up where uh, they were, Wayne Feeds was, or Allied Mills was starting a new mill, and I believe it was in Chicago. And he would felt like he was getting groomed and pampered to take over that position of running that new feed mill. Well, they come in and they they brought in an outside guy to take that position. And, uh, you know, just kind of irritated him a little bit, pissed him off, whatever you want to call it. So he left. He said, no, nah, that's – I'm I'm good on that. Or I'm yeah. going to go ahead and leave. So he left and decided to start his own feed company. And at first he was going to use Wayne Feed Supplements. And just be be like another we wanted to do it was like be a just another kind of Wayne feed uh, feed mill just over around Comanche area, mm-hmm. and um, they said no, no, we don't want you to do that. And so he said, okay, well then I'll just start it all my own. I mean, yeah, I'll use whatever I can. I'm gonna do it. Y'all gonna be a part yeah, of yeah, it or exactly. not? Yeah, <laughs> exactly. So that's exactly what he did, and uh, he he landed in Gorman, which Gorman at the time. Um, it was crazy amounts of peanuts. Mm-hmm. I mean, people, everybody and their dog was was farming peanuts there. And so he knew that um, the shelling companies, which there was a there was a company in Gorman that's there now. It's called Birdsong, but back in the day it was called Shells. And uh, they would take those peanuts and they they'd shell them out and they'd have these these peanut hole grounds that they weren't that were essentially just trash. They weren't doing anything with them. And he knew that. You could use those as a fiber source, a filler source in some livestock feeds, mm-hmm. and they were cheap. And I mean, because they were just throwing them away, they were yeah. just, just putting them back on fields and letting them rot and go back into the ground. And uh, so that's kind of where he landed there, is because he's, you know, about twenty five minutes from where he grew up. Gorman at the time was somewhat of a metropolis i mean it isn't now but back a pe- then a you peanut, know a peanut boom yeah town. you know back then they had two big two big peanut companies you know within the area and a peanut butter factory 
and they had a movie theater and all that kind of stuff. And now you drive through there and it's, there ain't much there, yeah. you know, but <laughs> red chain <feeds>. yeah, yeah. <laughs> but, uh, so he knew that he knew that he could do that. And so he worked up a deal with golden peanut, which is actually in Comine. Um, and, and kind of all over there, more or less up in like Brownsfield now, but, um, he, he can, they made up a contract where all of their holes that they made would be shipped down on a big pipeline straight to them. And so he got into where they were, they were running and then they would take these peanut holes and they'd pellet them out and they'd use them as, as peanut hole pellets. And uh, so they were brokering and trading commodities on peanut hole pellets as well as, um, you know, making regular, you know, just kind of cattle rations, you know, nothing too extravagant back then. There just wasn't much out there, mm-hmm. you know. It's, and did he did he have to build that mill that's there? Yeah, or? Mm-hmm. yeah so he started, there's actually a picture in our office. Um, he started underneath a tent with a, uh, a foldable card table and a, an old landline telephone. And that's how he started. So that's where it was at, and he had a commodity bar behind it. And uh, so kind of a cool start yeah you know and to have that picture there but so that's kind of how he got to where he was there and then from there um you know we dabbled around in a feedlot had a feedlot outside of town for from the early 70s to the early 80s so about 10 years roughly give or take we had a feedlot where they were um backgrounding stalker calves and they'd take them up and they'd ship them up north and then they had um <clears throat> feeder hogs so they were raising up feeder hogs and they were buying them local from a bunch of farmers around town and outside of town and some people around hamilton and back around Stephenville, and they'd take them out there and feed them up and then they'd ship them off to um to dallas and to, to hit up there because at the time there was a bunch of big sausage plants and it was a big deal up and around dfw area before they all moved out and kept going further north but Mm -hmm. so they did that um so you know then they had a sausage plant there for a little while actually in stephenville had a sausage plant and uh we're selling sausage links to piggly wigglies i don't know if you yeah you remember old piggly wigglies yeah so they would they would sell they had a contract with them they'd sell sausage links but uh so they kind of dabbled my my grandfather he was uh more or less of an the entrepreneur you know yeah. he, he didn't care he wanted to get out and try something new and he was all about finding new avenues and new ways of of doing something and so yeah it sounds um, like it he, he tried it all you know so when they weren't when they weren't doing peanut hole pellets as much uh they started grinding hay cubes so they'd get alfalfa from the panhandle or other kinds of hay grazer grass they'd come in and they'd grind them up in a big rotary grinder and then cube them out and they sold a lot of sold a lot of cubes like that, and they did it for quite a while until until the hay grinder just basically just it wore itself down, became obsolete. They couldn't get parts for it, so they just had to just kind of quit doing that and, mm-hmm. and switch things over back to mainly building rations for for feed and stuff like that. Mm-hmm. But and what did so it's it sounded like he was very flexible. Just kind of went with the times. When when did the horse feed kind of come in there? Was that a big thing at the start of the company or just cattle ration? If you own a business that sells a product or service in the Western or ag industries and you want that business to grow, go to the link down below, fill out the form, and we'll see if you qualify for free social media marketing. No, it really, it really was just cattle rations. Mm-hmm. I mean, it was, you know, b- back then there wasn't... I don't want to say that there wasn't there wasn't people who didn't have horses. There was, you know, there was plenty. Probably of Probably everybody just fed hay and oats. Yeah, you know, anyway. there was there was plenty of people, but like in that in that particular area, uh, there just wasn't like a huge amount of big ranches that were that had a bunch of horses. You know, it was a lot yeah. of farm ground, and uh, so I mean, there was horse feed for for like their plow mules and and other kinds of stuff back in the day, but. Um, they were doing a lot of cattle rations is really what he was into. We didn't start. I mean, we did horse feed and stuff like that all the way probably around the nineties and stuff like that, but it didn't really start coming on until probably about 15 years ago when Mm -hmm. we really started kind of opening up into that different Avenue. And when did, 
when did it get to where um it became to where you were y'all were sacking all this feed and distributing it to feed stores and, and really getting it out there uh so it started it started off where they didn't really have any dealers for a long time they mm-hmm. were just <clears throat> everything that they were doing they would just they'd bag out feed and they were bagging them in 100 pound bags you know they were bagging them out hand stacking them into a uh, bobtail semi truck and then they would just leave out mm-hmm. you know and they take and they dump 40 bags here 100 bags here and you know all over i mean really they just line them together and take off up north you know and hit albany and breckenridge and old knee and some of those areas all kind of remotely close uh, I want to say the first dealer was actually up in um, Perrin, not Perrin, yeah Perrin, just above, just above uh, Weatherford, mm-hmm. and um, and it was just a guy who was who was buying feed from him already in a bulk setting, and he's like, I've got people that that really want to buy some of this other feed, but they can't, they don't, they don't need a full truckload. Mm-hmm. Or a half a truckload, or even a quarter of a truckload. He's like, "Why not I just buy a full truckload and just start selling this to these other guys?" And he's like, "You should give me a discount." And uh, I think that started maybe late eighties, mm-hmm. whenever that came about. And uh, yeah, so, it just took it took another entrepreneur to, yeah. to find out about you could be a dealer. I exactly. Mean, I, I think that way. Also, I've done. I've dealt in and hay cubes and uh still doing dog food and it starts out i'm using the product Mm -hmm. uh if i can just order more get a bulk discount and then and distribute it through other people that want to use it just through your connections Mm -hmm. yeah for sure yeah and and, uh cheaping my my feed up you know my dog feed or my horse feed or whatever it is kind of distribute out it's that's how you start businesses (laughs) and uh that was like you said. That's how a feed store got started. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So they were they were doing that, and uh, and then just after after that one kind of hit. Well, my grandfather's like, well, you know, there might be something to this, mm-hmm. and uh, so then he, you know, kind of had some more people and started reaching out. Some people like, hey, you know, I don't know you buy a lot of feed, and there's a lot of people in the area. What do you say? You know, and and just kind of spreading that way, and now now we've got dealers kind of all across Texas, mm-hmm. and uh, but so it's been it's been really good. How does that how does that work to become a dealer now in modern times? Is it um, are y'all kind of set? Do y'all have like non competes, or is it just anybody that has a feed store? Kind of. So the way that we kind of do it is first off, we like you to have a storefront. If you've got a storefront, instead of just like. I want to sell this out of my old tractor shed behind the house, you <laughs> yeah. know, not to say you can't, it's just, it's a little harder that way. Right. Uh, you know, cause we want to see growth. We want to see people actually do really good and exceed, mm-hmm. you know, and, and so that's first off, if you can have or have a storefront or some kind of business front that you're already got going on, sell out of that. Um, we do, we don't put feed stores in the same town unless the town's, Big, big. So like Weatherford, there's a handful of feed stores in Weatherford. There's, there's, I mean, there's three dealers that I know off off the top of my head, and uh, but that's because Weatherford's, you know, spans. They're not ways. necessarily competing. Yeah, you know, but like some of the smaller stuff, we won't put a we won't put a a dealer in the same town. Mm-hmm. You know, if someone comes up and, and says, "Hey, I wanna, I don't really like that guy. I wanna start selling my own feed." <laughs> yeah, here two blocks down the street. No, we don't. <laughs> you know. We don't really want to do that. We don't want to. We don't want to mess with people who already are dealers. Right. We don't want to piss them off or nothing like that. So, and we kind of have a ten ten mile ish limit. So, like if you're, which I mean, there's some there's some leeway between some of the stuff. Like in Stephenville, Stephenville's not that huge of a town, but we have our own feed store, mm-hmm. uh, Red Chain Feeds Feed Store. But then we also have Texas Guns and Gear. Which is on the other side, going towards Dublin, but they only do deer corn and protein. Mm-hmm. So they don't really want to sell anything other than that because they're just an outdoor supply, right? And uh, you know, so it doesn't really. Not we're competing. okay with that because it doesn't hurt. It doesn't you know mess with our our feed store there on the other side of town. Mm-hmm. But 
So there's some leeway on stuff like that, but that's basically how it goes mm-hmm. is, is around those those points. But yeah, and I was just uh, just talking. I, I just did a video, uh, a business showcase that's that's on our YouTube for uh, for John Clam and Gap Ranch Supply. Yeah, yeah. And uh, he said he really liked dealing with y'all because they're a very small store in a very small town and. He can't order truckloads of feed at a time, right. and y'all will accommodate him to order a little bit of this, a little bit of that, a little bit of that, yeah. and and kind of accommodate him on the on the prices and everything where he can stay competitive. Oh yeah, yeah, for sure. I mean, on them feed store deals, we want we want those feed stores to to do the best they can, sell mm-hmm. the best things that they can sell. You know, have the best prices that they can. That way they can flourish and keep going. And hopefully, you know, they can grow and get right. a little bit bigger and then they buy a little bit more feed, sell mm-hmm. a little bit more feed. You know, that's that's always a good thing. But but if they don't, that's fine too. You know, yeah. we just want to see them do good. Yeah. And uh, that, that Gap store is a really good store. Yeah, yeah. and it's you don't want it to be mutually beneficial. That's that's what I I try to tell people with, with my credit card process and then I sell. is like I'm not a big corporation. Our company's not a big corporation, we usually do business with the people that we serve yeah, yeah. and then we're, we're more of a partner. Like, just like you said, like I want, I want to help your business grow. Whether if you need money, I'll help you find that. If you need lower rates on your credit cards, we can do what we can. If you know, if you need help marketing, whatever it is, yeah. I want to be a partner and a resource to, to that business and not just a, you know, them being an account number or whatever that exactly. you might see at a, at a bigger corporation, whether it's a corporate feed company or a corporate credit card processing company. And because it's mutually beneficial, the more feed that they buy from you, the more money y'all make. And the more the more feed they can sell, the more money they make the yeah. same the same way with our deal. Like I wanna I wanna keep you on. I wanna make sure you're you're selling a lot, whatever we can do to help. Yeah. Yeah. And then you know there's a lot of some of those newer feed stores, whenever they come on, they're like, "Hey, we don't, we don't know what we're doing." Mm. That's okay, you know. We'll we'll come through, and you know, we'll we'll tell you, we'll help you, you know, and we'll we'll tell you what what pushers that we know because every every area is different. But mm-hmm. so there's some areas where there's you know, they may push this one feed, this one certain feed, and it does really well in that one area, but it might not in a different. Like we've got a we've got a dealer that's down in South of Houston, and uh, they don't. They don't feed high protein cubes like 30s, 38s, DDG cubes, and stuff mm-hmm. like that. They don't need it. They don't need it. They don't want to pay for it because they've got so much rain, so much grass. All their grass is, they stay green half the time. It has a lot of, uh, you know, good nutrition to it that they don't want to feed that high of a protein cube. Mm-hmm. They want something like a 20 or 16%. And uh, whereas you get back up this direction during the winter, you want to feed something with a little bit more high protein to it, mm-hmm. you know, to keep them cows, you know, getting what they need nutrition wise. And uh so especially when you start feeding some lower quality forages like like haze, you know, during the winter, rolling it out and stuff like that. But down there you don't need it. So mm-hmm. there's different areas where, you know, we know that some stuff works and some stuff that they just don't don't need or don't necessarily sell that well. And so, you know, some newer stores will be like, well this might be more of what y'all are looking for. You might be able to sell more of this in this area. And whenever you start, you just kind of keep a tally of what you're selling. And if you don't sell, you get a ton of, you know, like a a 38% cube or a, a mixed a molasses horse feed. And you don't sell it, you know, very often. You sell maybe within the month, you sell 10 bags. Mm-hmm. Next time, you just don't order as much as that one because you know that it's not that big of a mover. Right. And you can buy some more of the other stuff or, or stock your store with more of the other things that are big movers, you know, like some molasses calf feeds or um, equine alfalfa plus or something like that. You mm-hmm. know? So. And, and besides the, the feed store and the bag feed that y'all, that y'all do, y'all also uh, run bulk, uh, bulk rations or bulk feed, whatever you want to call it. I know I've got some, some delivered to my house to put in bulk feeders and, um, and you can also kind of custom build a ration to what yeah, you need. Yeah, for sure. We do we do custom formulations. So that's that's the thing that we really are we strive, we try to keep that that 
which we are, we're a small family business, mm-hmm. but we try to, we try to strive to keep that small family business mentality where you can call in and you can say, I need to talk to Carrie Zip, our nutritionist. And you can get on the phone with him and say, this is what I've got going on. You know, I've got this kind of hay and these are what my cattle are. You know, I'm trying to get, I'm about to wean off 40 head of, of yearling calves and I want to grow them out for a hundred days. And this is the hay forge I've got. May kick him out on wheat for a little while. What do you suggest we do? And he can sit down and he'll talk to you and advise you and say, well, you know, if we've got something that that's on the floor stock or that's bulk that we continuously make that work for you, great. But if it's not, then we can always do a custom ration on there and add in some different kind of minerals, you know, or, or do something like that, that, that maybe, maybe they don't need as much protein because they're on wheat, but you still want them to, to, to stay full and look full and not, not be so scary or, mm-hmm. or not act so hungry all the time. So you feed them a little bit of extra supplement, a feed as a supplement, you know, mm-hmm. then we can discuss that and go through that. But so, yeah, we do custom rations and then we do bulk delivery, uh, within a hundred, 150 fly miles. So, if you're within 150 fly miles from us, we can get to you on a bulk truck. Um, bag feed, if you want feed, we can get it to you one way or another. Yeah. You know, um, bag feed wise, it's just have to find a different mode of transportation. If it's further than that, maybe that's a hot shot guy or catching somebody else that's going that direction or something like that. Mm-hmm. But we can make things work. But along with that, we also sell raw commodities so we do um we flake our own corn we grind our own corn um we can we sell sell to a bunch of dairies in the area Mm -hmm. you know around comanche stephenville uh even back towards abilene there's a bunch of dairies that we sell feed to uh flake corn ddg and stuff like that so we 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 kind of we get in because we have a rail that runs into gorman so we're able to buy stuff buy rail and then get it, bring it in, house it, and then we can pull out and, and sell just a regular raw commodity to, to anybody who, mm-hmm. who really wants to do something. If they wanted to grow up or, or start up a big background in operation, and you know, they don't want to buy a whole bunch of already pre-mixed feeds. They want to mix it themselves and use wheat lidge or, or some kind of silage or something like that. Then we can work with you and, and sell you the, the commodity itself mm-hmm. and help you save some money. Cool. So, uh, what is it? What is your job title? What's your role in the in the business? <laughs> I don't. I don't know that I necessarily have a title. Um, I do a little bit of everything. So I have a CDL. I drive a truck sometimes when I need to. Uh, you might see me on a bag truck. You might see me hauling flake corn, or you might see me filling your feeder. You know, <laughs> I don't know. Um, but. I also do some of the marketing, not very good at it, still trying to learn. <laughs> I do the social media, also not very good at that, still trying to learn. Um, and then I do some of the office stuff, just, just you know, mineral inventory sheets, some of the just stuff that's really not that glamorous. You know, yeah. I do some of that too. And 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 I don't know, you know, sometimes I work on the dock or if if there's a if there's a spot that needs to be filled in, I'll go fill that spot. Yeah. You know, unless I've got something else going on, you know, if we got a guy on the second line that's down that we got to get this, you know, 25 tons of feed sacked out, then it's not below me to go jump in on that second line. And Yeah, you're not scared to go do any job. No, no, no. You know, I, that's that's the way I brought up, you know, mm. so I was, they were, we had the feed mill ever since I was Yeah, you've probably born, worked, you know? worked I mean, every spot. Yeah, huh? yeah. I know how to do just about everything because. They made me do it, you know. <laughs> so I've poked rail I've poked rail cars out, you know, I've I've had to run the sledgehammer and I've I've bagged feed and stacked feed and I can run a forklift with the best of them, you know. Yeah. But but now I, I I do some other stuff in the office. I don't I'm not as much out there on the on the dock as I was, but and then uh just I check on the Steamville store and I do a little bit of sales stuff here and there. Um so I kinda run Abilene, from Abilene back to San Angelo, back to like Mason, back to Gorman. So that's my little slice of the pie mm-hmm. that I kind of take care of and try to do some sales stuff there and yeah. keep people happy and stuff like that. So, but yeah. I don't really have much of a title. I just 
do a little bit of everything. Everything. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, y'all got y'all got your store in Stephenville, and and you can buy feed directly out of Gorman, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, we have store there in Gorman too. And y'all y'all uh, ranch a little bit around there too, don't you? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I know I've seen some when I was working at Dublin. I've seen some some of y'all's calves. I mean, I don't know how many branches of family y'all have, but I always remember that Fritz last name coming through and. There's always some fat calves, so I know yeah, y'all are, yeah, y'all are yeah. testing your rations. I, I guarantee out. you, we definitely know how to feed them out. That's for sure. <laughs> but yeah, yeah, we we do a little bit of ranching around there. So my um, my grandmother has some has some land in Lingaville that I, I kind of manage her stuff. Um, she's got about 400 acres out there and 70 mama cows, and then we calve all them calves out and then i'll i'll pull them off and process them and i'll kick them out on wheat or if i've got grass i'll kick them out on grass and so i'll hold them yearlings for around 120 days 100 days and feed them out and doctor on them make sure they're straightened out lined out and ready to go mm-hmm. and uh but then my dad's got some country around in there um desdemona my my uncle He's got some country around in Gorman. And then my other uncle, actually, he lives on the old homestead property of my great-great-grandparents in Proctor. And so he he runs a bunch of cows. Or I say a bunch of cows. He, he runs some cows over there, too. So we're we're spread around a little bit, but we all we all dabble around into it. But, yeah, I mean, I think that's a, a big thing is that y'all aren't just selling it. Y'all are actually using it. And oh, yeah. If there's anything new that comes out or groundbreaking i mean y'all are able to say hey this is really good we need to start selling it's, this it's, it's like a research facility mm-hmm. but it's not a research facility <laughs> so for some if there's something that we're trying out you know and we're like i think this would work really well mm-hmm. let's let's put in that creep feeder and see how it does and yeah. if them calves balk at it they don't like it or they don't grow as well on it because we'll you know we, we'll take we'll, we'll take it like a research deal you know we'll make sure everything's doing good and mm-hmm. trying to see stuff like that. And and if they don't, then okay, then when we know that's maybe not the plan, you know, if, it, if our calves won't eat it, then, then somebody's that's an hour down the road, they probably won't either, yeah. you know? And uh, so we like to do that and keep them around. And it's, I mean, the feed business isn't glamorous, yeah. you know, but so you can get a little bored and uh, it's nice to do some, do some ranching on the side. Yeah. <laughs> so, what uh, what are some some struggles and then and then maybe some perks of of being in that business? I mean, you're not the actual owner, but you're very involved, and I'm sure you see both sides of it all the time. Oh yeah, yeah. Um, I don't know. Um, some struggles are is you you kind of like from the commodity standpoint. And you can you can get yourself caught into a hole pretty quick, and uh, that's one thing that that my dad he actually does a lot of the commodities buying, which he is the he's the he's the president of the company, and then his two brothers are partnered up, and then it's me and my cousin underneath, and um, so he does a lot of the commodities buying, and you know as, as you do as as most people know with cattle that that number that that market fluctuates. And it can fluctuate like that, mm-hmm. you know. One one thing of you know somebody saying that that China's going to quit buying all this all this stuff, you know. Yeah, or, or bird flu, or yeah, COVID you know, yeah, or anything. Or, yeah, that bird flu comes in or COVID. Yeah, it can change. It can change the market in a yeah, heartbeat. The Chicago market exchange basically like I mean, same it's, as the stock market. Yeah, it's a stock so. market. It's just you know livestock stuff mm-hmm. and commodities, and uh, so if you're not which, I mean, nobody knows. Nobody knows, no matter how much, you know, it's all just experience. But if you're if you're not kind of on top of those things, um, man, you can get upside down on some stuff, and uh, and it can be, it can be, you know, it can be bad because you're talking about buying buying 100 tons of product on one rail car, mm-hmm. you know, that's coming in, and, and you buy five of those rail cars, and then... And that's just a week's worth of product. And then y'all might already had it contracted and sold, and then exactly. So you you kind of you kind of have to price your feed based off your your price of commodities that are coming in, and um, so you know like some feed can come down 
when commodities come down. But if commodities start rising back up, then you kind of have to adjust your feed prices because it's not the same input cost as it was right. 30 days ago because stuff's, stuff's changing, which we try to keep it as, as, as level and smoothed out as we can and uh, where it's not. We buy we buy big bigger amounts of commodities so we can kind so of it's hold not changing all the time. Mm -hmm. That's and that's what I talked about with with John at, at Gap Ranch Supply was, you know, it's it's tough I think in our industry because as ranchers are are mar or farmers either one our margins are not very high. Then so we're we're trying to make our bottom line on the on the production side. But also you have the feed companies and the feed stores and and that side of it that has to stay profitable while also staying very competitive and trying to make everything work while the margins on both sides are very small. Right, uh, right. The, the margins on producing the feed and selling the feed are, are not as high as a lot of other industries and the the margins on us producing the, the finished product, the, the beef or the whatever it is, the protein, you know, is is not as high as other industries, but we do it because we love it most of the time. Right, yeah. So I think it's tough. I mean, we just talked about that, about it's tough to to make that work. You got to run a profitable business and keep everybody happy. Yeah. So You just got to stay on your toes. You know, mm -hmm. it's just like it's just like buying, buying cattle at a sale barn. You know, if you, you should never know. Yeah. You know, you might go out and spend, you know, and buy – buy these 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 good these good young yearlings or these good 300 pound calves or something like that with intentions of the pri the market staying as it is now in 60 70 100 days mm -hmm. and then something like that doesn't something happens and it's kind of easy to get upside down yourself and start to be sweating a little bit you <laughs> yeah. know and, and wishing them prices would go back up on them cattle but you know it's it's the same thing in the commodities deal too which we see both sides of it because we we so ranch and we yeah. <laughs> run the feed mills. Y'all so. are definitely sweating the market just because you, you think that the, the guy selling the feed is making a lot more money than the guy feeding it. But, I mean, y'all have y'all your own struggles and got to watch the board the same way as, yeah. same yeah. Way as the producer. Yeah. Now we, we get it, you know, better than most. I mean, some of them big corporate companies and nothing against none of those those companies – those companies are good. There's a reason they're as big as they are. You know, they're, mm -hmm. they're smart people that run them, those boards and stuff like that. But they can be sometimes out of touch with what the actual low end consumer, you know, the, the guy who's buying the feed, bulk or bag, what their needs are. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's something we try to stay in tune with. You know, that's why we, that's why we're set up the way we are, where you can call in and, and ask a question and, Anybody in the office can almost answer it because, you know, we don't want to have to give you the old runaround right. just to get one kind of answer out. And so we like to keep that same, you know, mm -hmm. mentality where it's kind of a smaller business. And But it's our ideas aren't small. We just like to keep the mentality smaller. Right. It's a little bit easier and stuff like More that. More connected. Yeah. Well, and I guess there are, I mean, the perks of, of owning that business is it's, it creates an income for your family, and and uh, probably a lot of people around Gorman rely on that income also. And then helps, I'm sure it helps y'all's bottom line ranching too a little bit, and being yeah. able to to produce that the best feed that's needed in that situation, and and kind of be a little volatile on that on that side. Yeah, yeah, for sure, for sure. Do y'all have any any changes for the future? Uh, I mean. You're probably in progression to to be running it or have a big say in it one day. Is there anything that that could be streamlined or changed that you see? You know, there's there's some things. Our our growth, our progression of growth over the years, over the past fifty five years, is is really only come out of demand or necessary. It's not that we've been just so so business minded that we just want to. You know, yeah. have 110 or 115 employees now and, and run this big company and have dealers all across Texas. We do want to do that. I mean, we, we are doing that. But um, a lot of it's come from, okay, well, we, we're we at max capacity on cubes. So 
I think it's about time that we upgrade, build a new cube mill. And so we've done that. And so um, future, we're we're just hoping just to stay to stay looking and, and in the in the in the stream where where we need to keep building on and, and expanding and but um just kind of keep up with demand yeah you know it's like we're having to put in a we're not we're not having to we're getting to we're getting to put in uh two new roller mills um uh, because of demand we've had so much demand and we're struggling to keep up and it's a problem but it's a good problem to have mm-hmm. and so now we're able to expand and further on and uh so there, there's some stuff that that i would love to to see um you know like being able to to break out of that 150 mile radius and and go on and and that's something that i'd like to do later on down the road but there's some stuff that's in the way you know if you know anything about about the trucking industry and you know um once you get past 150 mile fly miles, you have to start e-logging all your trucks or handwriting handwriting all them logs out, and that's a whole totally different sector of the government. You have to start dealing with, and as we all know, that can be a real hassle. Yeah, and try not to do as much as that as we can, <laughs> you know. And and uh, but but because of that, we we kind of miss out on on delivering a little bit further away and and reaching some customers that might be a little bit further away because mm-hmm. uh, we just don't go quite that far right now, but that's something I'd like to like to come up with an idea of how to expand. incorporate that and expand and make that happen. And uh, uh, other than that, man, we're just we really just want to. If there's some people who want to have a dealer in an area that we're not that we're not in, man, we're all about it. We want to mm-hmm. we want to keep keep putting up dealers keep selling feed all across Texas because, I mean, right now we're we're more or less centrally located and, you know, from I-35 to San Angelo and from Wichita Falls to north of San Antonio, that's really, that's our slice. You know, mm-hmm. that's that's where we sell a lot of feed. But I'd like to be out of that too, you know, picking up some dealers and, and selling some feed in some other areas. And we've got some of those right now. We've got a, we've got a place in, in Canton. That's that's a new dealer and mm-hmm. place down south of Houston, place in Amarillo, and uh, some some areas like that that are outside. But I'd like to see some more of that, you know. And and we're we're striving and pushing to to pick up some new business in those areas too, and and reach all those people. Mm-hmm. So, uh, do y'all do y'all make any uh, weird type feed that for? something that we wouldn't see every day for a different type of animal or anything like that. Yeah, uh so we we do some we get some of them custom formulations. There's some there's some different ones that come in. Um right now I don't know that we do anything too too crazy, but in the past um we we made some worm feed. There was there were some guys that were uh they sell the night crawlers that you could buy at Walmart mm-hmm. to to fish with. They were raising them. And so we made a, you know, kind of like a decomposable pellet that they could use, you know, and <laughs> and, and get nutrition out of to grow them worms. And, yeah, you know, that's that's a different one. And um, another one that we that we've done pretty recently is um, the whole ostrich and emu deal was was real big back in, mm-hmm. I guess maybe the the nineties or the nineties. Yeah, you know, and um, so there's still some of those people floating around. Um, there's some people down around Valley Mills that, that still get some Those are probably the people I, I saw. They post. lost 300, yeah. yeah. <laughs> lost a whole bunch of them on the yeah. river from they, the flood. They, yeah, the flood come through and knocked the fence out, and they were missing, well, like 130 birds or yeah. something like that. Yeah, yeah I saw that. So those those people, <laughs> we've made some feed for them. Yeah. And, uh, you know, but, yeah, there's been some there's been some strange, not strange, just some different, you know, just not run-of-the-mill type stuff, you know. Right. Not your your guy with cow or a horse or a pig, you know, or, <laughs> yeah. or sheep or something like that. But it makes the day interesting. Yeah. You know, we, we like having those people call in and trying to help them out too, just as, just as much as the next guy, right. you know, because they're all trying to, trying to make a business work, make a buck. So exactly. Why not? You know, no, I think it's, it's interesting. And I, I figured you'd probably have some stories. There's all kinds of people raise all kinds of animals. So, oh, man. and they yeah. all got to eat. Yeah. Yeah, they do for sure. 
What are some other interests or hobbies you have outside of the feed feed business? Well, uh, maybe if you know, you know, I like to ranch rodeo quite a bit, and I don't get to do it as much as I'd love to, but mm-hmm. I like to do that, and, uh, and it's kind of they work around a little bit every now and again and horse and cattle related yeah you don't yeah. stray too far yeah no I, i'm really kind of a meats potatoes type of guy you know <laughs> I, I like i like my horses I like my cattle and uh but i really like fly fishing i haven't been in a while but that's a hobby of mine that i like to i like to do mm-hmm. and uh, something about being you know five miles down a river out in the nature just mountainous area because normally that's where you go fly fishing or at least that's where i go right because it's so just serene and calm and nice and you get away from it all and just man it's always a good time but yeah there's something about i mean i'm not a big fisherman or hunter or anything but if you getting getting out away from civilization getting in the mountains whether you're going whether you're hunting or fishing a lot of people do that or if you're just trail riding or whatever it is hiking i guess getting out I, i've just always been enamored by the by the mountains and the wilderness and yeah. everything you just i don't know it's just like a stress reliever and you, oh. you're kind of like you're you're closer to god you know the the further away you get from civilization the closer you are to god get away from do. people get mm-hmm. closer to the lord ain't nothing better mm-hmm. ain't nothing better Have you ever asked yourself why it costs so much to get paid? Hey everyone, this is a show that has a lot of entrepreneurs and business owners on and the number one rule in business is to get paid, right? If you own a business, there's a good chance you're overpaying for credit card processing and there's an even better chance that you're getting terrible customer service. At Diversified Payments, we make the payment process simple for both the customer and the business. Being based in Central Texas, we're able to offer business owners personal customer service while saving them money on their credit card processing fees. And we're the only payment company that I know of that's deeply rooted in the ranching and rodeo industries. If you think you're paying way too much in card processing fees or you can't get in touch with your payment processor when there's an issue, go to diversifiedpayments.com slash wealthy cowboy. I can't fish to save my life. I can't. I can't. (laughs) Just gives you an excuse to (laughs) get out there. Yeah, I mean, I can't. I can't go out there to a lake or something like that and start catching fish. Um, Yeah, I get too bored too easy. You know, that's that's too much for me. But I do like being out fly fishing stuff like that, or just just getting out, like you said, just getting out and seeing some country and Mm -hmm. getting away from everybody and everything and just kind of relaxing. I guess that's that's more my my kind of vacations or like that. You know, yeah. Get me away from the beach. I don't want to be on the beach. There's too many people. Sands goes everywhere. Yeah. My kind of deal. But <laughs> you get me out in the mountains or or something like that. I'm all about it. Yeah. All about it. Uh what are you listening to all the time? You you just listen to music or you like to listen to podcasts or audibles or anything? I, obviously I listen to the wealthy cowboy. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I've been listening to it since you started it up. It's great. Um, I like to listen to podcasts, but I'm in and out of the pickup a lot. Like I do drive quite a bit, mm-hmm. but um, when I'm not, I'm driving around the mill or doing something like that. So I struggle with getting started, pausing online. and starting and having to miss stuff. So I do listen to a lot of music. Um, I listen to all kinds of music. It don't. It's my. It's very broad. Yeah. You know, rock, uh, country. You know. Uh, I don't know. Some of the stuff, I don't even know what you call it. I don't even know what you call some of that stuff, you know, some of the hip hop grunge stuff or whatever yeah. it is. But yeah, I like to, I'd rather do that, but then I can, because I don't have to actually focus on the what's being said. Yeah, it's just background. Noise, yeah, kinda. more or less. Just get away from the silence. What's your favorite restaurant? Oh, man, that's a tough one. <laughs> I don't know. Uh, I really like New York Hill and Strawn. You ever, oh yeah, you ever eaten there? I've never ate there. I've, I've, I mean, I've seen it, but I've never ate there. It's just, just cafe food. I mean, it's nothing special, but it is it's good home home style food. If mm. we're not, if I'm not eating that, then um, I do like a good steak. You know, I like to go to like Texas Day Brazil or something like that, where mm-hmm. you just load me up on the meat. You yeah. know. Um, I'm, I like that a lot, but just, just more of a local place, you know, it's kind of a grabbing the wife 
and going for just a Friday night deal. Yeah. Not, going, not not coming to Fort Worth. Yeah, not, not going too far. You know, run up there in New York Hill, eat a bite. That's good. Yeah, we've been to Texas Day Brazil once, and uh, the way I eat now, uh, I mean, carnivore. When I mainly, I mean, I, I cheat every once in a while, but mainly carnivore. I say and. Uh, that's like the best place to go. Obviously, oh, yeah. you can yeah. go sit and it's the cheapest, and I can go in there and eat all I want because it's hard when you're only eating protein, when you're only eating meat. When you go to a burger place, I'll get freaking four or five burger patties or something. I'm eating a pound or two of meat, you know, yeah. at, a, at a meal. So it gets expensive if you're not in the right spot. For <laughs> you, sure. you can go in Texas oh, Day, yeah. Brazil, and, and really get them. I feel like I get my money's worth. Oh, yeah. Out of that. yeah you, you can knock it out, get get filled up on the good stuff. Right. Right, you know. but, uh, what are some of your goals for the future? Um, Just to my, – my goal – as as company wide, you know, I like to just be improve, innovate, and expand on the livestock industry um, and feed, and then just stay stay competitive. You know, pricing. I don't want to get get to where it's too much about. I don't want to. I don't want to forget about where we come from mm -hmm. and, and and the people who, who buy the feed and, and what struggles they deal with. And um, so those are some goals is if we can just keep doing what we're doing mm -hmm. and maybe get a little bit, you know, reach some other people and sell them some good quality feed. Yeah. You know, uh, and that's it. But other than just that, you know, my goal in general in life is, is to uh, just – I don't know. Just keep following the Lord, trying to keep following the Lord in the right in the right manner, and and uh, try to be perceived as as a good as a good man. Be there for my family, and maybe one day down the road, I'll have some larger acreage to my name and some more cows. That's that's the real goal. You yeah, know? <laughs> it's, it's a, get some acreage and not cut up all this land that's getting cut up by right. some, by something that's got something to it. Kick a bunch of cows out and throw some throw some kids on some horses and run them around. Just you know? ranch, yeah. Just ranch. <laughs> run the feed mill. That's about it. Where uh, where can people find you and where can people find Red Chain? Uh, so on on Facebook, Red Chain feeds on Facebook. Um, that's really about all we got there. Uh, like I said, I'm trying to do better about social media and marketing and stuff like that. And so if you see some posts that are just subpar. <laughs> Bear with me. I'm getting there. <laughs> and then personally, uh, Facebook, Instagram, just Luke Fritz. And uh, those two places really where I kind of jump around from and get on and stuff like that. But I, don't, I don't do a lot of posting. Yeah. I mainly just watch people. <laughs> yeah. I'm I'm pretty uh, – I've got all platforms pretty much. I don't have X, but – I got a TikTok, but there ain't nothing to it. So. Yeah. I've, I'm old school. I like Facebook and uh, just what, what I started on. I, I kind of check the other ones and stuff, but I like Facebook too. So. Yeah. Hey, Facebook is it's the go-to. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Facebook Marketplace, find a bunch of good deals. I'm right. All about it. Yeah. All about it. Well, y'all check out Luke and uh, Red Chain Feeds if you're interested in becoming a dealer. Um, you can see about that. Um where you're located, everything, you can talk about all that. If you need some kind of feed, they can probably make it for you and get it to you, whether it's bulk or in bags, uh, get it to your closest dealer, whatever it is. Um, just reach out to him or call the mill. Um, Check out our website, www.redchainfeeds.com. Great website, lots of information. Yep, and uh, reach out to him if you need anything. Share the show out. You can rate and review it. That will help a lot. Uh, like us on Facebook. Uh, I post all the links on there. Crockett Crothers on Facebook. The Real Crockett Crothers on the other uh, Instagram, on TikTok. Uh, you can search the uh, hashtag The Wealthy Cowboy Show or hashtag The Wealthy Cowboy and see all the all the content I put out. So we'll see y'all next time.